and war criminals, war criminality, and genocide. From the massacres in Southeast Asia, during the Baines Johnson and Nixon regimes, to the mass graves dug in Panama under President H.W. Bush, beatings, electrocutions, and other forms of torture during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. All crimes against humanity and for top officials, all unindicted. While certain individuals who were intimately involved in these actions obtained the privilege to redefine what a war crime actually is and who a war criminal can actually be. War Crimes and Genocide Genocide by Western nations and Middle Eastern countries can be reversed and revised and forgotten. These worldwide war crimes, a simple courtesy of the gentlemen of genocide. Yes, I call it genocide because it's become clearer and clearer that Putin is just trying to wipe out the idea of even being able to be a Ukrainian. We'll let the lawyers decide internationally whether or not it qualifies, but it sure seems that way to me. They have just, over the last three months, passed an enormous amount of legislation, much of it designed to tackle corruption, just to name a few things. A new anti-corruption strategy, a new public procurement Bureau system, and national agency for prevention of corruption, uh, strengthened anti-money laundering regulations, creation of an anti-corruption bureau, disclosure of public officials' domestic and overseas assets for the first time, partial judicial reform, including of the prosecutor general, more to come. With all of that anti-corruption legislation and reform, it expects the nefarious activities linked to Ukrainian officials to decrease in quantity. This protest camp outside Parliament that he's linked with. Oversight to see that these measures were kept up to standards were deliberately undermined. An assault is underway both by politicians and Ukraine's rich oligarch class. All of which Ambassador Victoria Newland was well aware of. The Anti-Corruption Bureau set up at the insistence of Western donors to investigate corrupt government officials. It's being very publicly undermined. Rival security agencies have ruined its investigations, like this one into passports being sold. And MPs have repeatedly tried to destroy its independence. I only have a minute left, let me ask you, um, State Department face Victoria Newland seems to admit to the existence of bio-research facilities. Uh, Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities, which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. Days later, the Express reports that the Russians could be planning a dangerous bioweapon combining Ebola with COVID. Well, thank you, Allison, for the chance to be with you, as you know. Only days after the allegations of chemical weapons were made against Russia. His heart, when he called what we are seeing in Ukraine. Victoria Newland interviewed on CNN and appeared to wrap up an investigation that had only just started. And with regard to genocide, we have a process of collecting evidence over time, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, but I am going to predict that President, what President Biden called it is what we will ultimately likely find when we are able to gather all of this evidence, because what is happening on the ground is not an accident. It is an intentional decision uh, by Russia, by its forces to destroy Ukraine and its civilian population. As you say, it sure looks like it. But it sure seems that way to me. Now that is really interesting. A conclusion to an investigation announced right after the announcement of the investigation itself. The investigation, a simple formality with no meaning at all. Announced by the Ambassador Newland, the State Department Newland, the Kagan family Newland. Edward Kagan, husband of Victoria Newland and founder of the controversial Project for the New American Century. 
their documents criticized as insisting on long-term war following what the document states as a new Pearl Harbor. Brother-in-law Frederick Kagan, also of PNAC, and top advisor to General David Petraeus, helping to design the Iraqi surge under General McChrystal in 2007. Sister-in-law Kimberly Kagan, also advising General Petraeus, currently acts as the head of the Institute for the Study of War. Like the Biden family, the kagan Newland family seemed to have a deep love affair for war and chaos. A BBC article posted in February of 14 discusses an apparent bugged phone conversation in which a senior U.S. diplomat, Victoria Newland, disparages the EU over the Ukraine crisis. This is the conversation between Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and then U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. So, uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think, what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking, in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. Yes, we do know. Just as the U.S. State Department were literally in the process of setting up the new Ukraine government over the phone, the economic and governing experience of Yats is accompanied by the neo-Nazi experience. The Yats that Newland speaks of is Arsini Yatsenyuk, and the outsider that Newland and Pyatt mentioned, known as Chiknibok, is Oleg Chiknibok. Neo-Nazi sympathizers propelled to power after the Western-backed coup. The U.S. State Department itself placing power into the hands of neo-Nazis. told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the U.N. guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think the foul-mouthed Newland seemed to amplify her views on regime change only weeks before the Russian-backed Yanukovych was ousted and the EU, U.S.-backed leaders were installed. I figured out in my mind why Yanukovych that, but in the meantime... On part one of Chemical Romance, we demonstrated how Syrian rebels, backed by the United States, were entering Syria through Turkey's southern border. It wasn't long before a group of extremists were busted, chemical weapons in hand. They are suspected of having links with the Al-Nusra Front, which is the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Syrian rebel group. As these rebels were caught with chemical weapons, the Western allies paid little attention to the mounting evidence suggesting that these rebels consisted mostly or mainly of extremists. The opinion piece titled, America's Campaign Against Putin's War Crimes Can't Ignore Syria. A just rules-based international order. In my home country of Syria, Russian President Vladimir Putin's intervention to prop up murderous dictator Bashar al-Assad has enabled the regime to torture and slaughter tens of thousands of political prisoners. The author calling it part and parcel of the struggle against Putin's assault on the rules-based international order. In a the rules-based rules -based international, international, international order, order. It's consistent with our interests. He continues. America's forceful response to Putin's atrocities. 
atrocities in Ukraine is commendable, but Assad's war crimes, often aided and abetted by Putin, have been a daily occurrence for over a decade. It's time for the United States to stop ignoring Assad's brutality. The writer also mentions the Sudian Revolutionary or Opposition Forces. Rebel groups infected with extremists, such as the Al Nusra Front. Mosa Khatib, seen here being apparently laughed at during a meeting with the Vice Biden, was the head of the Sudian National Coalition and a supporter of the Al Nusra Front. While everyone in the West, over a certain age, knows the full story on Iraqi chemical weapons, during the early years of the war in Syria, chemical weapons were used as a pretext to give better weaponry and funding to rebels attempting to overthrow the sitting government of Bashar al-Assad. The Syria Transition Support Act of 2013 lent these tools to rebel factions, many of which were later revealed as extremist, some engaging in ghoulish acts such as massacres, later blamed on the government of Syria. And a particularly disgusting act that involved a US-backed rebel eating an organ out of a dead Syrian soldier's body. A fact that Russian President Putin raised, much to the chagrin of then-British Prime Minister David Cameron, who was very visibly upset when this barbaric act was mentioned in his presence. I believe you will not deny the fact that uh, one hardly should back those who kills their enemies and uh, you know, eat their organs uh, and all that is filmed and shot. Do you want to support these people? Do you want to supply arms to these people? After asking for NATO's assistance, Ukraine President Zelensky makes the claim that chemical weapons have been used against citizens in white phosphorus shells. Military police captain Tobias Elwood states, The allegations represent a despicable pretext for Russia to justify its own biological or chemical attack. Just days before, President Biden warned Russia not to use chemical weapons. And right after that, NATO chimed in, saying that it wouldn't get involved unless chemical weapons were used. Then suddenly the claim is made that chemical weapons had been used. Iraqi and Libyan chemical weapons in 02 and 03. Syrian chemical weapons in 13. Russian chemical weapons in 22. Western-backed extremists in Syria and in Libya, and in Pakistan, and in Egypt, and in, well, Western-backed neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian military, and the street patrol, with powerful partners to make a president, or to make him believe he's a president, rather than a conduit for larger plans. And, uh, and so, uh, but I want to make it clear, I wasn't then, nor am I now, articulating a policy change. I was expressing the moral outrage that I feel, and I make no apologies for it. If the West, or the Biden regime in particular, were really interested in war criminals, wouldn't the government go after some of its own offenders? While President Biden was the Vice Biden under President Barack Obama, a record number of Middle Eastern drone strikes killed thousands of non-combatants. In 2012, a Chicago Tribune writer named Charles Krottheimer captures the quickly dismissed war crimes in an article titled Barack Obama, Drone Warrior. The Osama Slayer card having been overplayed. What to do? A new card, Obama, Drone Warrior, steely and solitary, delivering death with a cool dispatch to the rest of the Al-Qaeda death chart. So the peacemaker 
Nobel Laureate, Nuclear Disarmer, apologizer to the world for America having lost its moral way when it harshly interrogated the very people Obama now kills, has become just in time for the 2012 campaign, Zeus the Avenger, smiting by lightning strike. Torture and murder by drone bombing. What is it that you're calling for? We're calling for him to be fired from his position at the University of California, to be disbarred from the practice of law, and to be prosecuted for war crimes. You, like former Vice President Dick Cheney, has been outspoken in the defense of harsh interrogation. Is was it worth it? Well, we haven't had an attack in more than seven years. And in a recent opinion piece for the Wall Street Journal, you writes, to limit the president's constitutional power to protect the nation from foreign threats is simply foolhardy. During the reckless drone strikes, a suspected terrorist was targeted in an area where civilians, who may or may not be related to the suspect, are also present. And in just the first few months of 2009, there were 16 reported. The Obama administration seems to be intensifying the use of these strikes. He's acted with vision and with confidence, and he's demonstrated an unwavering commitment to keeping us secure and delivering freedom to the Iraqi people. So it's with great... During the presidency of George, the decider, W. Bush, torture was as routine as the later discredited terror alert level system and were used on anyone thought to be harboring information. The vile acts documented in the torture report, released in December of 14, gave horrific details describing potentially specific war crimes. Holder is reportedly close to appointing an independent prosecutor to investigate whether White House lawyers violated the law. Among those possible violations, the waterboarding of a terrorism suspect back in 2003. Very early this morning, just after midnight, he started the trip in Russia, making slight progress on his desire to rid the world of nuclear weapons. In Italy, the president didn't get and everything. We'll probably make a decision in terms of how to pr uh, approach it uh, once we have all the facts gathered up. But you wouldn't resist categorically an investigation. <clears throat> I, I think that you know there are responsibilities that all nations have, even in war. And if it uh, appears that our conduct, in some way, uh, supported. Uh, violations of the laws of war, then I think that uh, you know, we have to know about that. The Bush administration resisted efforts to pursue investigations of an Afghan warlord named General Dostum, who was on the CIA payroll. Um, it's now come out there were hundreds of Taliban prisoners under his care who got killed. Right. Some were suffocated in a steel container, others were shot, possibly buried in mass graves. Would you support? Would you call for an investigation into possible war crimes in Afghanistan? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the indications that this had not been properly investigated just recently was brought to my attention. So what I've asked my national security team to do is to collect the facts for me that are known. It's time to move forward and not go back. But where's the accountability? Well, the accountability, obviously, is that people's reputations have been harmed very badly. The question is, is do we want America's image harmed more by dragging this out further and further? You got to, uh, what's going to be the positive result from airing out and ventilating details of what we already knew took place and should never have, and we are committed to making sure it never happens again? The late Senator John McCain, during his lifetime a policy or lawmaker, suggests that disregarding the law for the sake of prominent reputations is preferable. Torture, the vile acts that the senator himself was reported to have been subject to during the war in Southeast Asia. The Justice Department has completed a two-year review of Bush administration lawyers who authorized interrogation techniques such as waterboarding and going against the finding of its own investigators has concluded that the only thing they were guilty of was poor judgment. The lower level enabling functionaries who should have been just the beginning of a proper reckoning are now off the hook from the Justice Department led by Attorney General Eric Holder in a conclusion made by a senior career official. Those three attorneys showed poor judgment. That was a downgrade from the harsher finding that was made by DOJ investigators. The enhanced interrogation techniques were absolutely essential in saving thousands of American lives and preventing 
further attacks against the United States. As Joe Biden was dismissed by Cheney, it became a war between the Vice Biden and the Vice Cheney. And former Vice President Dick Cheney, here's the headline front page of the Daily News. Grumpy old men, Cheney and Biden, Biden duke it out over terror, torture, and the KSM trial. It is an act of war, what took place. Our objective is to make sure they pay the highest price possible for the inhumanity they visited upon our country. Whatever for is the best way to do that is what should be done. Now look, the fact of the matter is, the bulk of the people who were tried by a, any court in this country under the last administration were tried in a federal criminal court and they're still in jail. Those tried in military courts, some were not convicted, some were convicted and they're now out, and others the last administration released and released them into Yemen and are the very people we're fighting now. So I don't quite get what the objective here is. I don't care what you call it. I want that son of a son of a gun who was involved. Somewhere, somebody at Fox News or the Huffington Post was keeping score as if they really believe that every Sunday these talk shows is Super Sunday. I think uh, trying Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in New York's big, big mistake. It gives him a huge platform to um, promulgate his, uh, his particular brand of propaganda around the world. Uh, I think he ought to be at Guantanamo. I think he ought to be tried at Guantanamo in front of a military commission. They've got difficulties now because the, my guess is they don't want to send him back to Guantanamo because that would validate, if you will, the value of Guantanamo. They're trying to close it. Clearly haven't been able to get it done. I don't know what Dick's been doing lately. I don't know. Uh, um, uh, we did exactly what he did with the shoe bomber, Richard Reeve. Exactly what he did. We brought in the experts. I, I was told he said we didn't, didn't bring in the right people. The experts are the FBI interrogators. They are the best that we have. We brought them in immediately. <clears throat> they were in his custody. They got all the information they could get from him prior to him going silent. Once he, <clears throat> once he went silent, he was read his Miranda rights and put in the system. Since he's been in the system, he's continued to talk. In fact, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed told the International Red Cross in 2006 he lied to fool his questioners. He made stuff up from the past, from the Bush torture program, is that it yielded very little information. Um, there was talk uh, earlier after they dismantled the system we'd put in place for prisoner interrogation of high-value detainees. In September of 11, the Salt Star News of Ontario, Canada, reported on a planned speech by Dick Cheney. This announcement was met by anti-war protesters demanding that Richard Cheney be arrested for being a self-confessed war criminal. This was referring to items that Dick Cheney put in his book admitting to acts of torture that his administration authorized. Morning, former Vice President Dick Cheney has now canceled a visit to Canada over some safety concerns. Before another speech was scheduled in March of the following year, the former vice president canceled his Canadian trip, citing safety concerns. The Morning Call Allenwood newspaper reports that Dick Cheney had visited plenty of dangerous places, including Iraq in 2008. But apparently, according to Cheney, Iraq in 2008 was far safer than the mean streets of Vancouver in 2011. While some suspected that the only safety concern Cheney had at that time was an imminent arrest that could have occurred in a foreign country. I mean, these are very serious crimes. They're war crimes and they're not going to go away. There are foreign governments right now investigating uh, at least seven former Bush officials and uh, if we don't do so, uh, they could well be, you know, uh, they certainly aren't going to travel abroad, for one thing, but certainly they could be uh, theoretically tried uh, in absentia uh, of crime. The new president, with at least the acquiescence of the Vice Biden, would engage in another form of war criminality only months later. Drones carrying missiles into Pakistani airspace. They're guided remotely. The Pakistani government, I'm told, tacitly accepts these missile strikes. They won't accept American soldiers on the ground. The killing of American citizens 
who the administration decided were too dangerous to capture. While their family members and anyone else in the area, related or not, were destroyed as well. The NATO flag will now be raised while the NATO hymn is played. For the raising of the NATO flag, inner circle, right turn! Left, right, face! Take flag! Release flag! Emergency sirens wail in the distance. A fortuitous foreboding as the new NATO HQ is unveiled. Flag up! NATO. Arguably the whole reason this conflict began. The Kremlin believes that Ukraine joining NATO puts the Russian Empire at risk. What are humanitarian bombings? Of course, bombings of any sort are in contrast to any humanitarian effort. However, the humanitarian aid rendered by NATO sometimes needs to enter hostile areas to rescue indigenous people fleeing the horrors of war. In order to apply humanitarian support, NATO must sometimes bomb the towns and villages and other large areas in the interest of humanitarian aid and overall peace. These bombings are known in some circles as humanitarian bombings. At the end of the 20th century, Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic acted as the European Union villain, ripe for regime change. President Milosevic vowed to keep on fighting. Milosevic said it was absurd that Yugoslavia should accept what he called NATO's, quote, fascist approach. Milosevic was charged with the slaughter of countless civilians and a litany of war crimes dying before his trial concluded for the alleged violations. In March of 99, NATO responded to Milosevic. These pictures of what is alleged to be Albanian refugees struck by a NATO missile. Serbian officials claim that there were two separate attacks, killing, they say, dozens of civilians, 60 plus or more. NATO acknowledges that it was targeting what it says were military convoys in the general area. NATO bombs were reported to contain depleted uranium, a chemical weapon that for several decades has wreaked havoc on not only enemy forces, but Western forces as well. And this photo, standing next to NATO General Wesley Clark, is indicted war criminal Agam Shekum. In January of 99, General Shekum retires his commission in the Croatian Armed Forces to take command of the KLA, or Kosovo Liberation Army, while pending war criminal charges that would later be dropped, Sheikhoum would become prime minister of the country in 2006. In April of 99, the Telegraph UK wrote a story exposing NATO's training of the KLA. The latest evidence of growing cooperation between NATO and the KLA, once denounced by the West leaders as terrorists, and dismissed by military strategists as a ragtag force. Albanians herded around Kosovo like groups of migratory cattle. The Alliance spokesman James Shea enthusiastically predicted that the KLA would rise from the ashes to play an increasingly important role in the current campaign. One year earlier, in February of 98, Clinton's special envoy to the Balkans Robert S. Galbard had even called the KLA terrorist. 
though the Clinton administration quickly backed away from that term. The paper writes, Despite public denials throughout the war, the CIA worked closely with the KLA to glean intelligence about the disposition of Yugoslav troops in Kosovo. In fact, the CIA and NATO had been working with the KLA since late April 1999. To avoid working directly with the KLA, however, the U.S. military used the Albanian Second Army as an intermediary, according to the U.S. European Command. But U.S. officials say they were reluctant to become deeply involved with the KLA. The rebels had allegedly committed atrocities and were involved in drug smuggling, according to intelligence reports. NATO is bombing Libya longer than it was bombing Yugoslavia several years ago, and there is no end in sight. It's obvious that politics is a cynical matter. The protests came from people who want the United States and NATO to stop bombing in Libya, with the mission of protecting Libyan people from the country's military. The intended target during last night's airstrike in Tripoli was a military missile site. However, from our initial assessment of the facts, it appears that one weapon did not strike the intended target due to a weapons systems failure. Although officials in Tripoli claim more than 800 civilians have died in NATO raids. A counter protest featured people waving Libyan flags and calling on NATO to keep helping the rebels fight against Muammar Gaddafi's government. These protesters say NATO bombing is effective in stopping Gaddafi's military from attacking its own people. What we want is Gaddafi's forces to be eliminated. They've been killing Libyan people. From May until October of 2011, Humanitarian bombing on Libya killed thousands of Libyan civilians, NATO only admitting to a fraction of those deaths. One NATO bomb was on a news company, bombed on 20 July of 2011, killing three media workers, injuring 21. Director General Irina Bokova of the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization stated that media outlets should not be targeted in military actions. Yet no actions were taken by the UN or anyone else for the attack and murders of these media workers. The harboring and promoting of war criminals. The use of chemical weapons affiliations with more terrorist groups. Amistad México-Rusia en la Cámara de Diputados expresó que la cercanía de México y Rusia no puede ser como manifestó su homólogo ruso, Víctor Coronel. The Ambassador Salazar took an international trip to the southern neighbor of America and began what appeared to many citizens to speak with an authoritarian tongue. Traigo aquí la bandera, México, Estados Unidos, Uc Ucrania, Ucrania. Tenemos que estar nosotros en solidaridad con Ucrania y contra Rusia, ¿no? Se me parece que el embajador de Rusia estaba aquí ayer haciendo un ruido que México y Rusia estaban tan cercanos. Eso, perdón, Nunca puede pasar. Nunca puede pasar. A former Colorado Attorney General, Salazar, helped lead the investigation into the 1999 Columbine Massacre. He served four years in the Senate and another four as Secretary of the Interior during the Obama regime, becoming the United States Ambassador to Mexico by President Biden in September of 21. On the El País news site, the story of Vice President Kamala Harris's trip to Mexico was described as marred with tensions even before the trip began. Mexican President Obrador has stepped up references to American interventionalism and demanded that Joe Biden's administration revoke funding for two civil society organizations that he dislikes. They are taking too long. The Mexican leader said, USAID, an independent international cooperation body linked to the U.S. State Department, urging it to cut all funding for Article 19 
a global free speech nonprofit, and for an anti-corruption group called Mexicanos contra la corrupción y la impunidad. A later meeting between trade representatives generated fresh complaints. Lopez Obrador's energy reform package is planned to strengthen the state-owned companies such as Pemex and the Federal Electricity Commission. Mexico, main trading partner of the United States ahead of China. Before Biden, and even before Obrador, when Mexican President Peña Nieto was in office, then U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump began making alarming remarks about the Mexican Republic, one of which was printed on Salon and LA Weekly. While some may hold the view that President Bush entered the wrong country when pursuing Saudi and Pakistani-backed hijackers in Afghanistan, the future president, Donald Trump, announced privately, in a public setting, that Bush also invaded the wrong country when it came to Iraq. The Friends of Abe in Hollywood was a group founded by actor Gary Sinise. Promoting Hollywood conservatives, it was at this event, the paper alleges, that Donald Trump stated, We should have invaded Mexico, not Iraq. Maybe just another one of those jokes the billionaire likes to tell. The paper also says that Trump's statement at the Friends of Abe in Hollywood event was met with a rousing applause. A U.S. military invasion of Mexico would apparently fight illegal immigration or drug trafficking or something. The point is, Mexico and the United States had more problems than either country was willing to publicly admit. In the summer of 21, the Wall Street Journal asked if, in reference to Mexico's energy proposals, is Mexico's president a threat to its democracy? Those words stronger than they appear. As U.S. military invasions and occupations have been launched for those very allegations and a lot less. The Ambassador Salazar, along with others, began to speculate on the long-suspected Russian spies. Uh, is in Mexico right now. Those are Russian intelligence uh, personnel. Despite thousands of views on social media and television by citizens of both countries, interference in the affairs of a sovereign nation, the issue was forced. A Mexico-Russia friendly group was created. This prompted a U.S. commander to allege that Mexico has harbored Russian spies for years. Migration, human trafficking, those kinds of things are symptoms, in my mind, of a broader problem, and that's transnational criminal organizations. And we see that happening right on our border uh, in Mexico. My concern with that, Senator, is the instability it creates, the opportunity it creates for actors such as China, Russia. I would point out that the, the largest portion of uh, GRU members in the world uh, is in Mexico right now. Those are Russian intelligence uh, personnel. Weeks earlier, the Ukraine ambassador to Mexico asked for support against Russia, placing the Latin Republic in a delicate situation. Ukraine wanted Mexico to condemn Russia joining the echo chamber of other world leaders. The United States repeated this through Ambassador Salazar. Con Ucrania y contra Rusia, no? Mexico refused, stating to the effect that they will act as an independent nation, not a satellite to the wanton desires of the Western powers. De que México no es colonia de ningún país extranjero que México es un país libre, independiente, soberano, que no somos colonia de Rusia, ni de China, ni de Estados Unidos, que México es un país independiente, libre y soberano. Troubling behavior sowing the seeds of distrust skepticism and paranoia. 
of Russian spies hidden in dark corners and close to home. The Mexico Friendly Problem. Now the UN Security Council says it will meet tomorrow at Russia's request to talk about claims of military biological activities of the United States. Tonight, the White House Press Secretary calling those claims preposterous. Putin declared the war not only to Ukraine, but the whole West. He declared the war against Germany, against US, against UK, against Europe. On the Ides of March, the White House announced that the President will announce 800 million in new aid for Ukraine. USA Today noting that with that payment, the Biden regime has pumped more than two billion into the Ukrainian government since his administration began less than two years ago. That is an average of over one billion per year. We need freedom-loving democracies to support other freedom-loving democracies. And now, Russia, an attack on democracy, freedom. We are fighting here for freedom. For democracy. was an attack on democracy, on an open society, on freedom itself. These promises of democracy and freedom for the Ukrainian people, a similar message given to the people of Iraq, to the people of Afghanistan, a country where many people are in a more desperate situation than they were before the West involved itself at all. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're gonna, there's going to be a new world order out there. And we've got to lead it. This world order that President Biden invoked on 21 March. The orders of a world military, NATO, to escalate conflict. The orders given to extremist groups to implement radical changes in government. The orders to opposing leaders to seek exile or accept death or imprisonment. Combining regime change with the installation of new leaders, who are of course Western friendly. A war in Ukraine, a war about money, NATO, and respect of the rules-based international order.